Good evening. This is the Legislative Matters Meeting of October 7, 2019. Uh, Council Bill Dwight and I presiding. Um, uh, also, first, before we meet, we have, I'd like to apprise you that we are being audio and video recorded as for purposes of informed consent, so you know that this is going to be documented. Um, uh, Laura, please call a roll. Sure. Uh, Councillor Dwight. Here. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor Klein. Here. And Councillor Burke. Okay. And the city solicitor is indisposed and will not be able to attend tonight with, with excuse. So, um, first off, public comment. Seeing none, um, I'll accept a motion on the minutes from the previous meeting of September 9th. Their motion. Approved. Any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? And no abstentions, obviously, because that was everybody. Okay. Um, you can do the, what is the public hearing on? We, have a, we have a couple of possibilities. No, we yeah. have a public okay. hearing that was posted for this at 5 o'clock. But also, the mayor is here. If you want to do the public hearing, you can do the public hearing. You're fine hearing. with that? Yeah. Okay. Only, I don't okay. see a huge crowd here, so it's just going to yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, the, we, uh, 5 yeah. o'clock was scheduled, a, and we will convene a public <laughs> hearing uh, on proposed zoning changes. This is an ordinance related to wireless antennas on street poles. Um, do I hear a motion to open the public hearing? Move to open the public hearing. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay. So we're in the we're in the hearing. Um, basically, I only see one proponent, or will just or someone who can provide information. Actually, speaking for the city, um, will be Carolyn Mish. If if you want to, we're not going to force you. I didn't want to put you into it. Well, if but, you understand it all, that's okay. <laughs> I can go over it too. Okay, I'll want to. Um, this is an ordinance uh, to establish rules, installation rules uh, for small cell telecommunication antennas on street poles. And um, Carolyn wanted to expand and give us the explanation for that and what sure. that means. Um, so, once again, technology is changing or has changed, and we need to keep up. Um, so this, there, there are a couple of ordinances here. One would go into the general code that deals with streets and, and public ways, and the other is a zoning um, provision or amendment to the zoning ordinance. And um, there to address the sort of the technology that's changing to um, 5G um, telecommunications technology, but also just, um, I guess that comes hand in hand with um, the need to install these systems um, much closer together and they can operate closer to the ground. So we used to, we, you know, back in 15, 20 years ago, we had ordinances that established uh, special permitting and site plan review for large, for mono, what we call monopoles or 190 foot tall um, cell towers. And also um, for those panels that would be putting be put on tall um, accessory structures to existing buildings, like water towers or um, other kinds of um, exhaust towers on buildings, and that was all on private property. Now these are coming in to um, be installed much closer together and in the right of way. And we don't really have an ordinance that deals with that so far. For the few applications that we've had. Um, We've told the communication, telecommunication providers that they still need to come to planning board because that's the mechanism we have for installing new equipment. Um, these or pair, these um, ordinances would um, specifically identify these as an item that needs review by the planning board and also, um, so it defines what they are and it defines design standards. And then in the city's policy, um, streets and sidewalks policy section, which is outside of zoning, it um, also defines it, but also creates a policy that, um, that the city wants to encourage these, um, this type of um, communication system. 
and um, that it is regulated by zoning, and it also sets out um, a fee for use of the right of way for um, installation of these um, systems, and um, also specifies that each communication telecommunication provider will be responsible for any kind of maintenance or upgrade or removal of the equipment. So that part is in the city streets and policies um, section outside of zoning. And as part of that, as I mentioned, there's a fee established through this language that would be um, an annual fee, um, $400 per poll um, paid annually. So that's the... Poll with the... Or with the option to offer free service to right. the municipality. Yep. Or with the offer to pro uh, provide free um, services to the community. Um, the zoning aspect defines it in the um, defines what these small cell um, wireless communication systems are, and um, specifically that they're less than 50 feet tall. That um, the the cubic um, feet. Um, that the volume of the system is doesn't exceed 28 cubic feet, um, and that it still complies with the FCC regulations that um, have established these um, systems. So that's one piece that goes in the definition section of zoning, and then the other piece is how the zoning is applied. So if a if um, a new um, poll is required or new just like a telecommunications um, like cell tower that would um, be one review but if it's on existing poles then it would be an administrative review by um, the office of um, planning and sustainability um, or um, i'm sorry it's just going to um, there's a um, there would be sort of an administrative review of how these things get um, installed and that they have to, um, everything basically has to be underground except for the antenna themselves, itself, emergency shutoffs and wires between those um, two items. So um, um, they, the applicant must also provide radio frequency analysis to sh demonstrate that this is the smallest number of pole attachments required for a given location. That's consistent with the way the ordinance currently is, um, regulates uh, other um, cell tower equipment. And um, that um, this third part is about the review process. So the um, director of planning sustainability is the approval authority under this ordinance. Can I, um, as the other co-sponsor, could I just rise to just Absolutely. add something to what you wanted to yeah. say? Because yeah. I, I just wanted to also just give you a little bit of the context here, too. Because part of why cities and cities and communities are rushing to get these kind of regulations in place, um, not necessarily because we're trying to embrace the technology and get it deployed as fast as possible. Um, a lot of communities were having discussions with these providers and they were contacting us and they were trying to figure out how to get these installed, et cetera. Um, and then the FCC, um, under the current administration, basically passed um, uh, sort of like fast track regulations, which sort of took away all um, local control over these and basically said that you you basically, cities and towns basically have 90 days from when somebody applies to review an application and um, and go through some kind of a process to cite these. Um, you can't ban them. You can't, and if you don't uh, do anything with the application within 90 days, go right ahead and install. Um, so that's one of the things that happened and why a lot of now cities and towns are trying to come up with some kind of a permitting process. You can also only charge them you know, an administrative fee commensurate with what it costs to administer. So there's no like cell tower fees or any of these other things that we used to be able to get. And this was all because of the Trump administration's FCC who passed this regulation, um, which kind of took away local control in many ways. So that's what we're trying, what's what we're reacting to by putting right. in place these regulations. So I didn't want, <coughs> just didn't want to leave the impression that we woke up and said, hey, we want to support the telecom industry and get these things deployed as fast as possible. I mean. Not that we don't want that, but we were kind of forced into doing that. So you can see that our process 
is designed to be somewhat um, uh, you know, fleet of foot because we only have a certain number of time for when they file a permit. Right. So I just wanted to add that context. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, and as I mean, some of that mirrors what the current, what the existing conditions are anyway for pri on private property. The planning board could, even though we had a process, the planning board couldn't deny um, a project um, because the FCC had, under those rules, also said no. You know, you have to let these come in if if they're showing that they meet the technical standard. So that's where there was a lot of reliance on their RF analysis um, before these this new technology came forward, um, and and it's also you know, written into this section as well. So that we're clear, we're not trying to violate any FCC orders. <laughs> there, there are, from what the record show, there's no one else here to discuss in this public hearing about this issue, just so that um, anyone watching this video wouldn't presume that we were walking over anybody, but there's no one else who can testify. So, uh, are there any questions while we have Cameron here Relative to this, yes, I figured you just <laughs> didn't like you're about to, so go for it. Mm -hmm. So, the four hundred dollar fee is for each of the locations where they put these. Do you have any idea how many of them they're going to be to cover the city? No, and, and it may depend. It it may not be the same provider either. You know, it might be. Ask Boston. her how much Boston is charging. <laughs> per yeah, she told me. Yeah. But in addition to this fee, <laughs> they will pay personal property tax on these suckers too, right? So they they will be assessed and they will pay a fee to the city as as personal property tax on top of the four hundred dollars. I don't I don't I don't think the the DOR usually values that stuff, but I don't think they've come up with a number for them yet or the, the assessors said they're working on it but they don't have a number yet. So mm -hmm. it'll be I'm sure the A T V will but Dream of something good, yeah, 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 and probably be at it, be at uh, have a hearing about that one. So we're going to charge a four hundred bucks and whatever the taxes on the hardware to to have it there. But we don't know how many theoretically it's going to take to mm -hmm. cover the city because these are shorter distance things. So there's right. probably going to be a bunch of them. That actually goes to my concern now with the larger poles. We actually created it. <clears throat> we encouraged multi-use, multi-systems, multiple companies using the same pole so they wouldn't be bristling with poles. That'd be a little more difficult to affect here in this case if you have competing 5G providers and you have something of virtually every vertical space on in downtown Northampton with all these competing boxes. There, there's nothing we can do to somehow we can't require, well, we required the use of the same pole but not the same equipment. So in that case, we couldn't do that in this case, require that they use the same transmitting equipment. I <clears throat> you know, the reason, of course, for having um, so co-location co on um, the taller poles was because they were these massive right. um, projections into the um, into the view shed or to, um, the, and so uh, the idea was to limit those tall new projections to the extent that we could by making sure that we had as many providers on one as possible. Um, these for the most part will be existing utility electric utility poles which unfortunately proliferate <laughs> throughout the city already. They're already there. So well the, my concern, my principal concern is I don't really think this is likely, but we have five providers competing, competitive providers with five boxes on each pole because the distance between these is substantially smaller and higher concentration with more production of RF. I mean, each system could individually meet the RFF uh, standards of the uh, of FCC, but the the radio frequency uh, emissions, but in the aggregate, if you have six or seven or four on a pole, it not only the being rather unsightly and cumbersome, but also a higher concentration of 
uh, radio frequency transmissions. The, the, the current ones, many times, the provider doesn't own the pole. You know, a tower company owns the tower, and they lease space to everybody. And those are lower frequency but higher power things. These things would probably work <coughs> up on consecutive poles. I don't think they'd put more than one on any right. one pole. There's so many poles, you get four poles in a row, each with a thing on top of it. I doubt they'd all be on one pole because they sort of. I think is there one up by Smith already? I think there is. They were in the process of. Um, so they already went through the planning board yeah. anyway under sort of our current yeah. regulations. It's um, not at Smith, but between um, Smith and um, the high school, and then there's one. So I don't think it's gone up yet, but just in front of the high school, going down um, the. Um, not a tuck yeah. and then also on Riverside Drive and then there's a fourth one as well by JFK so um, I I don't know how far along they are on the one on Elm Street mm -hmm. I think it's there it kind of looks like a little stove pipe on top of a telephone pump yeah yeah, yeah my there are a variety of yeah. Options that look like a variety of droids that you could see in, the, in, you know, the cast list for Star Wars. Some are boxes, some are tubs, some are these things bristling with their own little antennas. There's, there, the, it's still a shakeout for the technology, so it's a variety of options that they're offering. It's just the the prospect of having uh, lots of them all over the place. In which case, um, there there is the View, the view issue, but more of more concern is is essentially the pushback we usually get from 5G, and and I've read the peer review studies. There, it's not conclusive by any stretch about the impacts of radio frequencies on cancer. Although there, the, even the FCC acknowledges there's a limit <coughs> that you want to subject people to in the public, and so they do. They put those limits on each unit. And as I said, that's fine given the context, if there's no other um, competing interests, if there's a single provider like the telecoms prefer to be the single ones, but that this technology supposedly invites competition, so there would be Verizon's version, AT&T's version, Sprint, whatever, and who met, any new company that happens to develop, Amazon one. In which case, you could have three or four with a higher concentration of radio frequency um, dispersal. And I, it, so, I don't know what our what we're allowed under the aegis of the rules laid out by the Fed. I don't think much. Probably not. Probably not. Um, and I do actually appreciate the fact that, as the mayor said, that we essentially we're trying to get out ahead of this instead of being caught short. And it makes sense, you know, again, as the technology kind of outstrips regulations and laws and outpaces all of us, and we're, we're still, you know, we're, we're looking at telegraph laws versus 5G network systems. But, uh, we did, uh, just sort of on that note about concern, health concerns, of, of the few that the planning board has reviewed, that issue has come up. Um, and so I think, um, I think there may be some people, maybe a lot of people, that don't realize that um, the board couldn't say no to these if they're showing they're meeting the technical, you right. know, dispersal or just, um, you know, distribution of the of the frequency that they haven't made. Um, I think that that part is still confusing for people. That um, even if people come to a public hearing and say, "We don't want this because we're concerned about health effects," the planning board can't say no. Right. Right, that's, thank you for noting that. Those. Yeah. Why, is, why is planning permitting needs and not the building department that tends to permit other stuff like this? Or DBW. Or DBW. Yeah. Another, uh, yeah. that we talked about a lot of different ones. Right. Because DBW typically does the right of way, so we kind of went around and around and around on it. So, yeah. I mean, it is, if, I mean, because it's in zoning, I assume it right. made, made, potentially made more sense to do it either between building and planning office, but I'm not sure that there's yeah. a magic to it. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know. 
I suspect the building commissioner would be mad if, at me if we did give it to building. <laughs> I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Um, they have so many things to regulate. I'm yeah. just not sure. Um, I would guess in terms they'd of a, be pretty happy, or they would be happy. But just that. in terms of like a time sensitive permit process, yeah. um, it's more akin to what they do, like a you know, like a zoning administrator function or something like that. Citing, yeah. As opposed to enforcement. So how's the plan? I wanted to kind of step back and just understand the basics here a little bit more. So I understand that the F from what the mayor said, the FCC um, created new regulations that if within 90 days we don't do something that essentially willy-nilly telecom uh, corporations could come in here, install these things without any permission from anybody in the municipality, is that correct? Well, um, I think it, it would be akin to um, sort of constructive approval when people, when applicants come and submit an application and it doesn't um, go to where it should go or get advertised, mm -hmm. then the applicant could come in and, and um, get a sign off from the city clerk saying, hey, 90 days has passed. Okay. So I, it's a sort of parallel, I, I sort of see it as parallel to statutory provisions under zoning um, but I think that's the basically the um, the intent is you get so many days to respond and if not we're just going to do it. Okay yeah. and so um, essentially what we're trying to do with this is we're making a little bit of money from each of the installations we're requiring that <clears throat> all of the um, the wires and things are underground. Um, Not the wires, anything that so, so if there's backup generation or any other kind of equipment. So the wires have to connect up the pole. Okay. Um, and there's an emergency shutoff. But yes, everything but the emergency shutoff, the antenna itself, and then the wires connecting them. And is that something that needs to be regulated in terms of, I mean, if telecoms uh, companies came in and put in their put the antennas in, they could do it in some other way? I mean, is that really something that is giving them a regulation to which they would, they have to adhere that they would not adhere? Yeah, I mean, this probably goes back to a little bit um, sort of parallel to what um, Councillor Dwight was saying, that <coughs> the equipment comes in all different shapes and sizes. <coughs> and so, yes, you could, I mean, it can get pretty loaded and bulky on the itself and of course that's the easiest place to put it because you don't have to dig underground but we're trying to minimize what's what's visible and what's you know burdening the right of way that might be right next to a sidewalk or you know um, the street so we're also giving them dimensions in terms of how high and all of that kind of stuff mm -hmm. that isn't built into the FCC's um, regulations about how these things could be installed so we're, we're right. Creating different safeguards that are, that are going to protect pedestrians and trucks and whatever else, and um, the health and safety of our residents essentially is, is the idea behind um, what we're creating. Here. Right. Is that correct? To the extent that we can. Okay. So, um, Councillor Dwight mentioned a few companies that we know of. I mean, how many corporations are we talking about here that actually are installing these kinds of things currently? Do we know? It ha I guess it matters how many mergers and acquisitions happen every year. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, I can only think of, you know, naming all the providers that, you know, we have here locally, um, you know, AT&T, Verizon. Verizon seems places. to be the only one that's contacted us about it. Right, so far. But there was another company a couple of years ago but they they were, to install they were, new poles. They were a third party. They were a third party. So Mobile that's line. the other piece is there could be other players who just um, are not are sort of a um, provide a service, but they're not like phone companies. They're just so, you know, I think it would be hard to um, really um, put a frame around how many of those companies there are. And I think they would be changing. Um, even if there are 10 today, there might be seven tomorrow and then 15 
I'm good at. Okay. So I guess I'm also curious about the four hundred dollars that the, the fee that was set, how that was determined, and um, it was there some kind of you know birth within which we needed to work to set that fee. If we're talking about these, you know, huge mega corporations, could we not be asking for more than four hundred dollars? Um, how was that determined, and what was the thinking behind it? Do you want to answer that, or? Well, we I think we generally we have to look at other reasonable fees and what it you know you have to set a fee to be reasonable, and like when we look at things like um, what are the municipal lien certificates? Um, what do those go for? They're like. 400 bucks 500 bucks mm -hmm. other kinds of permits for um you know um curb cuts you know or right. you know our you know i think those are or like, right of entry or right of entry That's all of our right fees are kind of right around those same that same dollar figure so that's sort of what we came up with i know boston has come up with a much higher fee yeah. what was it like twenty five hundred dollars per unit yeah. um i don't know if that's going to withstand uh, legal scrutiny of being just a tax because you know you have to be able to show that it costs twenty five hundred dollars to process an application and have you know have either the planning board or Wayne or you know or someone in his office you know sign off or look at the blueprint so that's the, really the threshold is what how high you can make it before somebody will sue you or challenge you that it's a legal tax but it was I mean the idea is to create a fee that um, you know, has some basis in, in um, on the ground reality and rec and also reflect the fact that, you know, every time you're adding something to the right of way, it's going to be a burden that the city would have to, or could possibly have to address. So um, I think, again, there's probably no magic to that number, but taking in all the other factors about m making sure that it makes, that it's makes sense, but also that it's not too high that um, so we can't take into consideration who the customer actually is that is being charged this fee. It really has to be based on kind of what similar fees. Well, then are. it would be an income tax, basically. Yeah. That would be that would be prima facie a tax if you were saying we're going to do it because they can afford it. So uh, that's the challenge. And again, I don't know if they would challenge or not. Like I don't know what they're going to do in Boston, for example. I'm assuming there's going to be a lot of these in Boston. What they're going to do is pass them through to the consumer. That's what they're potentially. Doing. Yeah, I don't know how much they can pass through or not. I'm not sure. But and then I have a last basic question about the technology. So this is supporting 5G technology, correct? And does it supplant the towers and the things that currently exist that telecommunications companies are using? Um, I'm not a tech person. <laughs> Currently, we are available is actually even 2G service is still available, 3G, 4G, which, so we're in flux. And in fact, actually no iPhones, for, for instance, are capable of, uh, at this point of using 5G service. So we're in transition, but it is conceivable there will come a point that if 5G is successful, all those are rendered moot. They become uh, unusable. So to understand, the 5G is dependent on these more the more frequent placement of these right. antennas as opposed to these big the larger range yeah. moths that yeah. are in the you know the towers at the VA hospital or wherever right. else. Right. The most simplistic description is that higher concentration and closer power, but faster, much faster, download and upload speeds okay. and transmission speeds. Okay. So. so this is really the only way in which these antennas can be placed is in, with, with increased frequency um, and closer to where people are actually using them, it sounds like. Right, and I will say for the applications <laughs> that we've received already from Verizon, they've said they need it now because of all the demand that's being placed on the network now, so it's not even they're putting them ahead of the 5G when, uh, yeah. the introduction. So, um, you know, they're creating this demand for us and then we're demanding more. <laughs> so, um, and I guess the, the last thing I'll just say and the question I have, and I, I'm just worried that by approving this, I mean, there's the whole health piece, which we're, I'm not even going to touch, but um, the questions about 
the impact on health is the um, the potential unsightliness of this. I mean, these poles anyway are not beautiful and we have so many things attached to them and all that kind of stuff, but um, I mean, at some point, is there some way to step back from this and you know figure out if it feels like the landscape is becoming too cluttered? Um, you know, I guess we can always change zoning, <laughs> but I, I have some concern about that, I guess. Well, I think that um, I, I understand concern. I'm not sure what the answer is given that we, can't we have that. to let them come. Yeah. So, um, yeah, got it. Oh, and I have one actual, another technical question. So the polls are actually owned by other entities, not the city. So do, do these companies not have to get to create some kind of relationship with the communities that own the polls on which they're mounting these things? Well, they do come in and get a poll petition, so they do have permission to use the public right of, right of way to plant the polls. Yeah, that's the company who owns the polls. Yeah, whether it's Verizon or National yeah, Grid, they yeah. kind of split half. They own, you know, they sort of own an. But equal. then the telecoms companies that are using the polls don't have to. They get a lease pre usually. Probably. So they're getting a lease from that company, and then they're coming to us with this um, with an application after they've accomplished that. I don't know what the order is, but I mean, you know, maybe they are in process of getting a lease. So we wouldn't have to lease. see that they've already created this lease relationship before we approve their application? I mean, that's sort of a private, I, I mean, I would say no, we don't usually do that with, um, you know, other. And they're not gonna be able to put it up if they don't have a lease. Right. So they can get it, I doubt they're gonna spend money getting it approved. Um, they're probably also going to try to put them on Verizon poles. If it's Verizon, they're probably going to want it so they don't have to, you know. So we have no responsibility for due diligence around knowing what, you know, whether or not they've established a relationship with the company they're leasing the pole from. Okay. That's what yeah. I was curious about. Thank goodness. I have a, another question about the, about the physical aspect is that uh, you have emergency shutoffs and such like that. So this is different from the fiber and the foam wires, this is actually a wire that requires a vault that's below ground, or assumed below ground with the pole. So that would require them to dig and uh, create an underground vault that's accessible in order to get uh, for emergency shutoff. So- The shutoff would be on the pole. Oh, that's right, I'm sorry, I did notice that. The shutoff will be on the pole, right. but other equipment, any other affiliated equipment besides the antenna would be underground below the pole, then yeah. not, not some massive right. secret vault where everything congregates, but it's for each, each, each implement, each mechanism will have its own separate dedicated underground vault under each pole. That sounds mysterious. Was that model recommended somewhere? Or we, I'm sure we didn't just make that up ourselves. Well, we have underground vaults for other yeah. So yeah. I think that was the idea is, well, we know it's possible and we, we do it. In, um, we also just didn't places. want these huge utility boxes right. springing up everywhere right. in the right of way. So it's sort of a trade off. Yeah. So if we get a bunch of petitions all at the same time, a bunch of applications at the same time, and it's in a dense densely packed area we're gonna we could potentially have like digging happening at this pole and then the next pole and the next pole all right councilor carney did you have any questions no. well given the described constraints well actually i'm sorry we're still in public hearing so um are there any other questions for carolyn or any other <coughs> comments I'll accept a motion to close the public hearing. Move to close the public hearing. Second. Okay, all those in favor of closing the public hearing. Aye. Please aye. say aye. aye. So, want to keep going? Aye. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, we'll get to that. That actually um, is the first item up, which is of course item nineteen point one two five. That's the ordinance related to wireless antennas on street poles. Um, uh, can I read it? <laughs> What's that? No, I said, are you going to read it? Uh, do you want me to read it? I can. 
And for the for the record. We read it for the hearing, so. Oh, okay. Uh, this is an ordinance related to wireless antennas on street poles. And the uh, be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and the City Council Assembly as follows. Add subsection 285-53, small cell telecommunication antennas on street poles. A, it is city policy to embrace wireless small cell telecommunications to improve telecommunication services for all users while minimizing adverse impacts and covering the city monitoring and administration costs. B, wireless and all other telecommunication antennas are regulated by zoning. Section 350-10.9 telecommunications, uh, personal wireless facilities and small cell telecommunications, that's the title there. C, each wireless small cell telecommunications antennas on public ways or public land including those that are already installed, shall pay an annual $400 for right-of-way access and inspections. Fees shall be waived if the wireless telecommunications provider provides free community or city Wi-Fi services in accordance with a service agreement signed by the mayor. D, the telecommunications provider shall be solely responsible for equipment and safety, for moving equipment at no cost to the city when required for any city construction project, and for ensuring that there is no impediment to pedestrian or traffic flow. And then amend uh, three, uh, subsection 350-2.1 by adding the following new definition. Small cell telecommunications, also known as small cells, are wireless telecommunications antennas and equipment that are mounted on structures less than 50 feet tall, including their antennas, or are not more than 10% taller than <coughs> adjacent structures with antennas of less than three cubic feet in volume. There's two commas there, probably want to delete one. And with wireless equipment associated with the structure, including wireless equipment associated with antenna, with the antenna and, and any pre-existing associated equipment on the structure. There is no more than 28 cubic feet in volume. For the purpose of providing 5G wireless telecommunications consistent with the Federal Communications Commission, Regulation standards and orders for small cells, including no RF, that's radio frequency, in excess of FCC rules. Small cells are distinct from satellite antennas elsewhere defined in this section. Also subsection uh, 350-10.9 by adding a new subsection D, small cell telecommunications by adding subsections 1 uh, through 3 there under inclusive. One, an application for approval of a wireless small cell telecommunication shall be granted if it meets the requirements set forth in the section 350-2.1 and the following design standards. All equipment other than antennas, wires to the antennas, and emergency shutoff shall be placed in an underground vault. Antennas shall be located at least seven feet high on the pole. Only the emergency shutoff shall be placed at ground level. Two. Wireless small cell telecommunication applications must include radio frequency analysis to demonstrate the proposed equipment will have the smallest number of pole attachments necessary to serve the city, that rooftop and tower, city's preferred locations, are not feasible, and that equipment is located on arterial or collector street locations over residential neighborhoods. And three, the director of planning and sustainability shall be the approval authority for small cell applications and shall approve any application that meets the requirements set forth herein. So I'll accept a motion for a recommendation. Move to approve. Second one. Uh, okay. Kelly, hey, what? You want to go? Want to <laughs> I go? just, I, I'm sorry, I didn't say this before. I just wanted to reiterate the planning board did um, have a public hearing on this and they voted to recommend approval. They were, they did question the height of the seven um, equipment seven feet is being potentially too low um they didn't have a magic number but they just thought that it um might be worth considering that okay. struck me too so almost figuratively and literally <laughs> but i mean that uh given you know i i just for fun i went and called up a bunch of images of various uh what are we going to call them mechanisms, devices, whatever. <coughs> Some of these at seven feet would be, the bottom would be at seven feet. Um, 
And that's the minimum. So, you know, that's always written as a minimum. But, but as such, we don't describe the width except for the, uh, the volume. volume. So it is possible that they, for instance, if they stick out, if they're on a park, if they're on a street pole and they're sticking out into a parking space, for instance, on Main Street at seven feet and they're sticking out four feet, that a truck perhaps or a van uh, pulling in could actually end up damaging them or vice versa. They could be damaged by the... No trucks get damaged downtown. <laughs> That's true, but I I don't want to start right, the trend of the tr the truck eating phone pole <laughs> or the truck eating five G tower, but and I don't know, you know, it's it, this is difficult. I recognize because we're trying to create standards in the absence of current existing standards, that so we're sort of making it up as we go along. I don't know for sure. I mean, I. I have the same concern, but at the same time, I don't. I don't actually have a definitive answer, so I don't know. I feel uncomfortable just arbitrarily setting a height. I mean, the, the other thing is the telecommunication. These are designed by. They come into us designed by engineers. They look at the precise site and right. see what would work. They don't want these damaged any more than someone Obviously. wants their vehicle damaged, or probably even um, they want that. <laughs> um, it's more of a concern for them. So um, I'm not. I think they probably take into consideration projecting into the street for sure. Um, but would it make sense to embed some language that would stipulate that they um, the that the tower cannot encroach on beyond the curb, say, or something mm -hmm. that might actually adversely impact parking and or somebody even moving down the street? Should the uh, I think that would make sense. I don't think it's going to, I mean, I think it doesn't, um, it wouldn't hurt the ordinance for, you know. Mm -hmm. Would you like planning and sustainability to develop some language to bring to the council? I would prefer rather than rather us than to try and sort of cobble something sure. together yeah. on the fly. Yeah. That would make me feel a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I just want to add to this too that um, the aesthetics around it, I think the safety and trucks and all of that is really important. But if you're thinking that there are people who are, you know, six foot five or whatever, that's really, seven feet is in their sight line pretty, um, pretty readily, I think, you know, just if they glance up, it's right there. And even, you know, shorter people, I think that seven feet is still much more in our sight line than even eight or nine feet. And so um, for aesthetic purposes, it seems to me that another foot or two would really be useful. I think it's a valid concern that the planning board brought up. So I would like to look at a, something that is a little bit higher than the seven feet. We do have regulations relative to street signage, for instance. Uh, uh, well, I think, I mean, we have awnings that are have to be at least seven feet. I think right. that's where the number right. came from. Um, every picture I'm looking at, the thing is on top of the pole. I can't imagine they're going to put these things down that low. Well, some, no, some of them are, um, some are actually mounted in the middle, but yeah, well, I, I, I if it would be, I would feel more comfortable if there were at least some language that gave us some protection in that respect. And as far as, um, I, I take your point, I think you're right. It's obviously in their best interest to have it so it doesn't get damaged. I, mean, I don't think they give two hoots about the aesthetics, but. What else um, goes far, they go further in the areas. So. That's true, although I think these things rely on relay more than anything. So their concentration, they relay, um, I can certainly bring the language back. I mean, if you wanted to move it to council floor for, I mean, that's over a week, so we could- Well, yeah, that was my next question. Is, is there uh, urgency? Is, um, uh, I mean, can these, we can't apply regulations retroactively to our to existing applicants, right? Or can we? Um, we do stipulate we can charge them the fee. Right. But the, I don't know is if you can make a rule and charge it retroactively. <clears throat> apply it retroact retroactively, especially in zoning. But yeah. yeah, and you could say something simply is can't be placed below the center point of the pole. That gets it good enough in the air. But I can't imagine that you put the high is the center point in the pole. How tall are our poles? Twenty five feet. It depends on the pole actually. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, that's well over seven feet. Because usually, you know, 
telephones on the the, vo the voltage is at the top. Um, you work your way down. There's a place where cable is. Telephones usually on the bottom, so they got to find a place where they're not interfering with anybody else. Usually, we're talking outside. about 25 foot high poles, and you're talking about a center point that's already at 12 feet, which is a lot higher than the seven feet we're talking about. I don't know if we need to craft this, but it's just. I mean, well, I think I don't. I think it would be. Um, I don't think it's going to be difficult to, I mean, it's, you know, a few added words. So, um, about not projecting it, you know, beyond the curb line and then 10 feet minimum or center of the pole. So if you guys want to take it back to committee for November, we can do that, or I can just bring it for the council meeting. Another alternative is that we can forward it with a recommendation on the stipulation of waiting language on, uh, um, height right. placement. Yeah. Or as they say around here, the height. The height. <laughs> What's the preference of the of the committee? How would you like to proceed with this? Would you like to proceed with the recommendation with the stipulation that we're awaiting uh, amended language from planning, or would you like to send it back, and then we it'll just skip back. It can skip back. Yeah, I don't mind there. sending it, moving it forward with the understanding right. planning is going to be more specific relative to the location. I mean, we're comfortable. it's going to go higher. It's, right. Right. it's not going to be seven feet, it's going to be higher than seven feet. I think it just matters. When you look at the pole, there's already things. There's telephone, there's cable, there's the voltage. I'm thinking, for the most part, they're always going to be on top of the pole, but if you want to say above some, such and such. Above the existing wires on the pole, or something like that, even. Right. That kind of language also provides <clears throat> at least definition to the, the lessor as they're negotiating their contracts with the lessee that is simply saying the city requires us to have it at this height. Mm -hmm. And as they're trying to figure out who gets what on the, who gets what real estate on the pole, it'll be defined yeah. better. So. Yeah, that picking order is already there. Yeah. Um, okay, is that okay yeah, with, with you and Councilor Klein? Yeah. Okay. So with that stipulation, the, the motion is to uh, approve with the stipulation uh, that we and that recommended language will come back to the council hopefully by the council meeting so that we can amend it on the floor. So, any further discussion on that? All those in favor, please say hi. Aye. 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 Any opposed? No abstentions. Okay. All right. So was that Councilor Murphy's motion? That's good. Uh, it was kind of, I think I moved it. There we go. And Works for that, me. Wasn't me. <laughs> You made the original say, motion. Yeah, okay, we'll you made the original forward. motion, and yes. Um, okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Way back when it was between Councilor Murphy and I mean Councilor Carney and Councilor Klein. Right. Got it. We did a whole lot of gobbling. Yes. There. I'm sorry. I forgot that there two other zoning tonight. Okay. Um, now, uh, thank you, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, your Honor, why don't we go? Why don't we skip right over to you? And that's the item. Mayor's here to this. It's basically deletion of the union station. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's um, union station. No. That's right. So this is item 19.128. It's an ordinance to amend. Chapter 312 of the Code of Ordinances by amending Section 312-110 to delete the reference to Union Station parking lot. Uh, the, it was referred to TPC and legislative matters with a positive recommendation, and it is now before us. It also, um, yeah, then we'll, we'll, so first I'll accept a motion on, to put it on the floor. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Oh, okay. Uh, Your Honor. Okay, I'll try to just briefly explain the history of this. Um, so, uh, to begin with, the Union Station parking lot is a privately owned lot. The entire lot is privately owned by the ownership of Union Station. Um, uh, and there's approximately about 180 parking spaces. Back in 1986, um, then Mayor Musanti um, got authorization from the City Council uh, to negotiate a 99-year lease with the then ownership of Union Station um, to be able to have 
access, municipal access, to about 75 of the spaces in the lot um, to be used for public parking. Um, and it was 99 years, and it was like a dollar a year. Um, and it was basically in exchange for, at the time, the city making repairs to the lot. The city agreed to repave the lot and do some other repairs. Um, it was at a time when I believe the train service had stopped. Um, and so, um, for whatever reason, the then depot uh, restaurant, I guess, uh, this, was a, this was a good trade-off for them. Um, and so, um, we've continued along. There was another, um, there was an amendment, a slight amendment to the lease that was made um, in the 90s, didn't materially change it. It actually moved the location of the city spaces closer to Pleasant Street before they were up higher and it made more sense to put them closer to Pleasant Street, but the same conditions apply. Um, and so, uh, fast forward, um, the it was always kind of, everyone always assumed it was a municipal lot because it said Union Station and there were some meters and you paid to park. Our lease is only for 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and then it reverts back to private parking overnight though. So we have no control over the overnight parking. We have no control after six. We have no control before eight. Um, but to the outside public, it often appeared that, hey, this is the city's Union Station lot. Um, when, um, when Union Station was then sold by Matt Petoniak, and you know, when he owned it, um, you know, Spaghetti Freddy's closed, and basically the lot was empty most of the time for many, many years, and people just got used to parking in it and just assumed, oh, it's a free, free parking lot, except for the city spaces that you had to pay for um, you know, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, they then purchased it, reactivated the space, you know, turned it into a banquet facility, turned it into a, um, you know, the, the tunnel bar obviously was already there, but the sports bar, um, and um, began having, expressing some concerns to the city about just sort of the interplay between when it was the city spaces and then when it became private. Um, we had no right to do anything after six o'clock um, so if somebody decided to come at four o'clock, pay for an hour's worth of parking, and then leave their car all, there all night, we had no role. We would, we could only enforce it from um, from four to or from five to six or four to six. Um, and so as there began to be these sort of tensions between the parking, um, and so we began having a conversation about two or three years ago about how could we better manage it, how could we better. Um, you know, deal with these sort of conflicts. I believe they, um, they have come to council at one point to express their concerns about it. Um, and so we sort of went back and forth between like the city, um, you know, managing it, managing the whole lot, or, um, or the possibility of them managing the whole lot. Um, and so uh, where we came down on was um, rather than the city uh, managing its 75 spaces as a municipal as municipal parking spaces and basically having um, you know metered machines and having uh, meter uh, PEOs go out there to enforce it and get tickets and all that um, that we would work on trying to create a unified parking system for the entire lot. Um, so we uh, discussed the possibility of would if we did that would. Um, would uh, Union Station take that over and would they pay for all the equipment and pay for the, you know, the gate system and pay for all the payment system um, and essentially pay the city the revenue for its spaces at the front of the lot. Um, so um, they, after several years, they said that they would be open to that. Obviously, there's been new additions to the down to the Pleasant Street corridor with you know progressions opening a 75 seat brew pub. Um, with an area of parking space to their name, um, and then other systems opening, Live 155, other systems. So that is what's only going to put more pressure on the lot. So um, we basically um, uh, issued an RFP. Um, so first off, I, when I first looked at this, I thought, do I have to amend the lease? Like, do I need to amend the underlying lease? Um, and like, go, you know, get authorization to amend the lease. But the lease basically, um, said that the city would be granted access to these spaces and could use it for whatever system they wanted to use to uh, either collect fees or not collect fees. They could use it for par public parking or transportation. And basically, it was the lease itself 
the original 1986 lease just basically said the city would have access to these and could use them for public parking. Um, and so that's sort of what we've been doing. So the idea was we would just basically contract with someone else to manage it for us, uh, those 75 spaces. So it wasn't actually a lease amendment because the lease wasn't going to change. The terms of the lease weren't going to change. Um, so we put it out basically an RFP that said, we want somebody who will manage our spaces for us. You have to allow public parking from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. You cannot charge any more than any of our, you know, any of our other parking rates in the city, any more than our highest, you know, the, the highest rate we currently charge is 75 cents. You can't charge higher than that. And depending on how much you charge, you have to reimburse the city at a certain rate if you charge you know, 50 cents or 75 cents an hour. Um, so those were the terms. We put the RFP out. Um, we did get, interestingly, got some inquiries from like private parking company managers, but um, they quickly realized that it was sort of, it would be challenging for them to do it because they'd also have to have a contract with Union Station as well as with us. So they'd have to come up with some unified contract because obviously, we don't own, own any of the land, and the other, you know, hundred and uh, you know, hundred and twenty some spaces are their spaces. So they were really the only ones who could pull this off. Um, and so um, they responded to the RFP. Um, and the other stipulation in talking, and this was part of our conversations with MassDOT, is that they would have to provide um, free access for uh, train passengers to be able to drop off and pick up riders. So the first 15 minutes would be free so somebody could drive in, drop somebody off, and drive out without having to pay. Um, so uh, they agreed to sign a three-year contract to see how this would go. So we currently have a three-year contract with them. They installed the uh, parking system. It's basically the exact same system we have in the parking garage. So you do not have to, um, you can't get a ticket. You basically take a ticket when you get in. Um, you can park as long as you want, and then when you leave, you pay. Um, they have the right to, um, to comp their own uh, customers, which they can do. So if you are you know, a platform bar, you know, they can actually validate your parking for you. Um, uh, but other folks in the lot you know, have to pay uh, that 75 cents an hour, or the, but the first 15 minutes are free. Um, and then they pay us a set amount of revenue each year um, uh, based on our, basically, their management of our spaces. Um, so that's the arrangement that we came up with. Um, and, uh, and so we're, so far, we've, um, it seems to be working okay. Um, there's been some conversations about the train and train access, um, which I know people are working directly with Union Station on. Um, but that's where we are with this. And so all I'm doing now is asking to go back and sort of remove these from the ordinance book um, to basically clean up the ordinance book. I don't think they would be enforceable anyway, um, but um, we just didn't want there to be confusion um, with, the, um, with what's on the ground and what's in the ordinance book. And we have obviously uh, moved our pay and display kiosks out of there and they put in their new kiosks which are similar to the ones in the garage the pay and display stations um, so that's what this is it's both basically going to clean up the ordinances that was the succinct version that was the succinct <laughs> version. Yeah. Um, i'm sorry it's, it's complicated because a lot of people think why did the city give away their parking why did the city lease these parking spaces to union station why did it give away its public parking and it's like it wasn't actually our parking lot. We had like the air rights to use it, but only for a set period of time. We couldn't allow overnight parking there. We had no right to do that. So the whole issue of like, what if I want to park the you know, for the train uh, for three days, the city never had any right to let anyone do that. Um, and so um, I know people have said, well, it costs you know, $18 to park there for 24 hours, it costs $18 to park in the parking garage for 24 hours. And actually, if you drive to New Haven Station, it costs, coincidentally, $18 to park for 24 hours. So, and you know, it costs to park in Greenfield to take the train, it costs to, to ride the train in Hartford, Providence, Penn Station. So uh, people have said we should have free parking for train riders. Um, but it's not our lot, so we can't give it. And the people who would have had the power to do that would have been MassDOT, and even they didn't insist on 
free parking. They have required access to the station, which they have to provide, um, and obviously this access for pickup and drop off. Um, so, which is also a um, it's also a car talk uh, <laughs> character. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. Production. Um, <laughs> the official driver. Uh, so this arrangement <laughs> actually exists with the current ownership. Is this something that, that passes on uh, if ownership should change? I mean, it's a three-year contract. Um, so it's renewed So we'll have year. to renew it. And, and I think just as, so we, we wanted to see how it went. They've obviously made a significant investment of funds um, to put in this technology and put in this station. But... I mean, that, one of our goals was to like, either we should do it or you should do it. But right now it's like this two headed thing and, and nobody really knows what's happening. And they're, they're asking us to manage our customers. You may remember they used to, uh, you know, on certain nights they would just go out, they had a little booth, like a little shack and yeah. somebody would collect $5. Right. Um, but they had no way to tell somebody who was parked there who didn't pay their $5 to like pay their $5 or unless they towed them or something. So. Um, so we think that this is a better way to manage the parking and that, you know, you, it presents as a unified lot where actually we, the one nice thing is that we don't have to manage any of the technology. We don't have to fix any glitches. We don't have to pay, you know, we don't have to enforce. Um, we've actually repurposed the, the, um, kiosks and we're going to repurpose them to other places where we've been trying to replace meters. Um, uh, and so, you know, we'll have three years to sort of see how it works. We're, we're handling, I would assume all parking complaints probably come to us as opposed to going to the depot. No, they go to them. Uh, to, so if someone, but someone's impulse would say, as you say, no one could really mess in some cases, probably couldn't discern the difference. Well, we've done re-signage. We took down all of our signage that was city branded, and they've put up their own signage, which has their number, okay. and their yeah. number to call, and if there's a glitch with the gate, and they have control over it. So they're the ones handling all the problems. So if the gate gets stuck or something happens, they have to deal with it. So to my original question was that, say, within three years, ownership changes, and then um, the ownership the new owners don't really want to take on this. Uh, then we would have to work with them to, I mean, well, I mean, we have a 99 year lease. So yeah. we would, um, if they didn't want to renew the contract, then they would have to, we'd have to figure out a new system going forward. Um, and again, maybe they would say, we want to have some third party manage it or have the city manage it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, most times when people sign up to get a parking lot, they think, bank they get tons of money they can charge fifteen dollars a car or well that's the other piece yeah. here i think that's that i think they finally sort of realized because we were talking about this for like three years and i think they realized that they did have this asset which was a parking lot and that a lot of people you know wanted to use it and that they weren't really collecting any any revenue <coughs> so they're i mean under the terms of the contract if after six o'clock they could raise the rates the only they have to keep the rates at municipal rates from 8 a.m to 6 p.m so they could raise the rates higher again which they could have done with or without this contract because it was their lot after six o'clock and they, they were charging like five bucks on friday nights to park there was the was there any uh tax agreement that uh gave, gave them a discount for no. instance, for, for providing the municipality with a, a serviceable lot that was nope no, it was, I don't, and again, um, the owners, the current owners would have never agreed to this, and they, um, it was a simpler time in the 80s. It was a yes. simpler time in the, the 80s, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, they're responsible for all the maintenance, they're responsible for everything. All we did was repave their lot once in the 1980s and got this 99 year, you know, dollar a year lease of these spots. Is there no benefit to the city to sell the lease back as it were? They weren't just... interested in they weren't interested um, in that. Um, yeah, I mean the question would be you'd have to get it appraised and valued and you know you but I don't I don't I didn't first I don't think they wanted to do that. I mean they're essentially a nighttime business right. anyway. So their, their biggest problem was just that transition from the daytime to the nighttime. And what was increasingly happening is, you know, if you worked at Eastside Grill and you were like a waitstaff person, you knew and you had you went on shift at five o'clock, you knew you could get there, pay for one hour of parking and leave your car there till 2 a.m. Um, and you had this downtown parking. And then if they had 
a wedding or a function, like there were all these cars in their lot. So it was sort of like this well-kept secret. Again, the city couldn't do anything about it because our jurisdiction ended at six o'clock and they didn't want to, and it would have been a big operation for them to tow people, including potentially some of their own customers. It would be hard for them to know what were their customers and who were not their customers. So this is a way, and again, by validating their own customers' parking, they're still providing free parking to their customers and just charging other people's customers who want to use the lot. You know, so if somebody wants to go to Progressions and they want to park in their lot, they're not, you know, they have to pay, but if you go have a beer at the, at the platform bar, you can get your parking comp. It just seems really convoluted that we have this long-term lease and now we're essentially leasing it back to them in a sense. We're not, we're, we're basically contracting with someone to manage our parking is it really what it is. It happens to be the owner of that yeah, space. it happens to be the owner, but they invested in the system and the management, you know, they invested in the technology and the gate system and all of that, so. Um, and really, nobody else could have really done it because they would have had to have, it would be hard to say, we're, we're, we're putting a gate up only for these 75 spots, and then how do you get to the other 120 that belong to Union Station? So, um, and you know, when MassDOT did the um, station, they knew this was happening, and they actually paid for some of the paving and some of the island reconstruction, because they supported it too, because they wanted it, yeah. They wanted to end the confusion so people who wanted to use the train would sort of know what was going on. Um, and so, again, they made the capital investment to do this. And I, assuming, I don't know what their numbers are right now, whether they're seeing a return on it or not. But, you know, clearly with a lot of the new investment that's happening on Pleasant Street and new businesses and new, I'm assuming there's more and more pressure on parking. So, anyway. I mean, obviously, if you're taking the train and you're going to be overnight, you know, the garage, I would say, is still the better place to park because it's indoors. Your car, you know, you can come back, your car's not covered with snow. And, you know, it's, it's like 0.2 miles or something from the station or 0.3 miles. It's not that far away. So, um, but they're going to have to work out with the ownership. And that was the other thing. People were coming to ride the train and they would literally walk in and say, and just sort of talk to the owner and say, so okay if I leave my if I you know leave my car here for a couple of days and they would take down the plate number and sort of because you know if it snows they have to know what to do with the car so they're still going to have to work out some of those logistics um, but that's really their their deal so we again we had no right to negotiate any of that because of the 6 p.m. cut off in the 8 a.m. time frame so any other questions about this. And we did, unfortunately, as is often the case when you go through our ordinances, we did discover a couple of other um, references, including an ancient ordinance that still referred to the depot lot, not the Union Station lot. So there's a couple of others that will be trailing along behind to that were cross-referenced that are basically the same purpose, unless you want me to come back and give my brief uh, no, I've description. <laughs> but they just they didn't all get sent along at the same time, but they're coming. So there's 56 years remaining on this lease. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. And again, I would say, you know, I mean, um, we also discussed, to your point, you know, I discussed with them the possibility of the city purchasing the lot because I think it would, you know, there'd be a certainly a public policy interest in the city owning this lot, uh, but they were not interested in selling um, because I believe they view it as a valuable component of the property. Um, you know, see that. So they didn't, they weren't interested in selling, but I would, certainly if they were interested in selling, I think I would come back to you and would make a run at doing that because I do think it would be great to be able to control that entire lot, um, but that's not what they want. So we did have a discussion about that. Any other questions? Um, Councilor Nash, did you have any questions? I know that you. I'm very grateful the mayor showed up to explain <laughs> this. <laughs> Uh, well, I came to TPC as well. So. Yeah, yeah. Can you just make a recording of that whole thing? Yes, and I can should. show it at the yes, council. Yes, a hologram. Help us out. Uh, put it in a drawing. Yes. <laughs> Help us out. Uh, you you want to uh, uh, I don't. It's been a while, but I don't remember we put this on the floor. We did. Did we? Did we? Okay. You did. So, any discussion on this? All those prepared to send this forward with a, a favorable recommendation to the council, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Okay.
Okay. Thank you for taking me out of order. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's thank always you good to know a little bit more problem. about the city we serve. It makes you out of order. That's true. <laughs> out of order. It's not the first time. Um, and you. now you. we're at item 19.114. This is an ordinance relative to stop signs that already exist on Fulton Avenue. Uh, uh, I'll accept a motion to put it on the floor. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Councilor Nash is here from the TPC. You'll notice that this has an extensive. Uh, there, there were there was uh, uh, two waiver requests. Gymnastics. It's just two waiver requests from one from the chief of police and one from the uh, 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 chief uh, Donna Scala. <laughs> Lascalia. Lascalia. Yeah. Cat, um, to actually fast track this. The the fact is that they are the stop sign already does exist, but Councilor Nash, can you give us the, maybe even a briefer history on this? Well, I, I have to, I'm hoping to be at a church by seven o'clock, St. John Cantius, I have to. Oh, right, you've got that meeting. Okay. Yeah, that's coming. So, so um, yeah, that, you don't have to shoot for seven o'clock. You can go quicker if you want. Yeah, it's okay. All right. All right. Nutrition. All right. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, so this was, uh, so the stop signs were already put in and Councillor O'Donnell and I talked about, well, you know, that the, that this, uh, that the police department and DPW has the right to put things in um, for 120 days, but the, the council still has the authority to actually ordain putting in stop signs. So we came up with this double ordinance thing, which you see before you, one is the you know, the, um, the emergency ordinance allowing the police department and DPW to install the signs, and then for us to have our more thoughtful process, which we're having right now, which is um, that these stop signs are a pretty good idea. And that, um, and part of where, uh, what I found interesting is that I wanted to also understand the reasoning for why we're putting in stop signs now in, in in such a quick fashion when we have police officers there most of the time. And uh, during the TPC, what became evident is like they're not there all the time. That the police actually do go home at, uh, at you know, once NETA closes, um, although they hang around for a bit after that. Um, and that um, these stop signs are, effective for those hours of the morning where the police aren't there. And that, uh, and that in the long run, the expectation is that the police won't be there and that um, these stop signs will be necessary. How's that? Did I do good? <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> I, uh, I assume these meet the criteria for our standard criteria and, and highway criteria for uh, stop signs. I am assuming that as well because the city does not because uh, the DPW is not very interested in unnecessarily installing stop signs. Uh, other questions? This is uh, a, a stop line, a stop sign at on Fulton Avenue on both ends, right? Both ends. Uh, the, onto Con Street and onto Pleasant Street. We, we actually don't have a map, but I'm pretty sure everyone knows what we're talking about. Actually, when the police are there, they only let you go one way, don't they? Right. 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 They only let, they, it's set up to only go one way. I had discussions with Pleasant, the owner of Pleasant Journey, uh, Jack, who, he, he, he doesn't like that the police are there all the time, and he's looking forward to that ending at some point because he thinks it's uh, not helpful for his business. And, um, but he's very supportive of it returning to two-way traffic with the, the stop signs there. Is this an anticipation with eventual, uh, net as possible eventual uh, discontinued use of uh, uh, extra duty officers serving? Uh, that I've had discussions with NETA and they intend to keep the officers in place for the time being. Um, there will come a point where they start to, uh, in fact, that uh, uh, 
Leslie Laurie conveyed to me that they've actually cut back on some of the officers. Um, so I think they had three on duty. They're now down to two. And that um, so those, some of those cutbacks are already on the way. Uh, but as long as there continues to be this congestion going on uh, that NETA expects to have officers there. And also on, you know, that with, with their eye towards um, days where they're expecting a lot of, you know, that yes, things may calm down, but they know that around the holidays, around 420, uh, that there's certain dates where they're, and times where they're going to need to, you know, possibly bring the police back. Right. So. But, yeah. To be determined by the event. Right. Um, okay, any, any other discussion on this? Uh, all those in favor of sending on this on with a favorable recommendation, please say aye. 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 They oppose abstentions. Okay, there we go. Well, since you're here, Jim, since virtually every other item here has something to do with you. Uh, <laughs> Item 19.136 is an ordinance to amend Chapter 312 Vehicles and Traffic. That's to amend the definitions of parking meter and meter violation history. This is referred to the TPC. And it has not been I mean, discussed yet. And it's still pending. So um, I you would suggest that we, we continue this. Continue this because we're not even put it on the floor because we have. Or the last stops theoretically. Mm -hmm. uh, that is also true of item 19.137, so we'll skip over that. Um, and these are the items that uh, most recently came out. Uh, this is um, the uh, an ordinance relative to parking on Arnold Avenue. Can we take them as a group? Nope. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to recommend was to take them as a group parking on Belmont Avenue. Ordinance relative to parking on Elm Street and on West Street, uh, and then we'll 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 do those A through D. These come from the TPC, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Do you want to speak to these? I mean, uh, item A, B, C, and D, which is also item also cataloged as 19.140, 141, 142, 143, coincidentally. So, hit it. All right, so um, that. Uh, actually, so, I'm sorry, can I have a motion to put these on? The I would move them as group. Oh, okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, now, sorry. <laughs> I got you all revved up. And then, okay. okay. And I need dinner. <laughs> so um, so th where these, these came from is that um, the mayor's office um, has a number of administrators that um, meet once a month to discuss parking related matters going on in the city. And uh, it, I believe it's also related to implementing the, the parking plan that we've been steadily implementing. And that, um, that from that group, this was sent forward to the TPC. Um, so this is coming from DPW, the police parking department, and uh, that, uh, that this is to um, on uh, city right of ways or city streets around the Smith College area to begin um, uh, metering uh, some of the spaces up there, and that um, that the that this proposal when it came forward to the TPC back in June, um, that the TPC discussed the these. Um, these ordinances and they voted on sending them forward with a positive recommendation to city council. The, um, the thing that um, in discussion with uh, Councilor Bidwell that and, and with the mayor's office was that we needed to do some sort of outreach related to these, um, these new ordinances and we wanted to not do them over, had do that outreach over the summer when, um, when staff and students are not there to come in and provide um, their, their thoughts. So I held them back at the TPC and Councillor Bidwell did some outreach to people at Smith to let them know that 
we were welcoming any comment on these uh, proposed ordinances at our last TPC meeting in September. Um, when the item came up on the agenda, there was nobody here to speak to them. And so um, I, they are here today. And, and the other reason I wanted to keep them at the TPC is because we had all of the expertise at the table to speak to why this measurement, why this particular system, why this particular fee, and that um, that I'm presenting you these packages, this package today, with the idea that the experts have weighed in on it. And I, you know, if you want to go into the particular details of everything in this, I, I think we need to pull in like. Um, Ms. Forsall and, and, and Maggie Chan to really speak to things. But I can tell you the TPC is sending this forward with a positive recommendation and that we've done the public, we feel we've done the public outreach uh, to bring them to you to uh, weigh whether or not to send them forward to City Council. Questions? I, I mean, I would have expected if you had heard any objections uh, particularly from Smith students, it would be why you're taking away free parking, essentially. That I could under, I could understand that, but uh, so I can anticipate what their objections were, even if they didn't show up. Um, and the likelihood of them showing up, obviously, is not wouldn't have been great to begin with. But that said, I mean they, these seem like appropriate appropriate designations. Um, mm opportunity for parking turnover, to promote parking turnover and create an expanded inventory. What helps some of the businesses proximate to uh, Green Street and what uh, uh, and West. So I don't know. I mean it seems it seems fine to me. I every, everything that I read when I looked at these diagrams it seemed appropriate and I in absent any objection I have no problem moving forward with it. Um, anyone else? No? Okay. Well, that's good. That, uh, so, um, all those in favor of sending this forward with a favorable recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? No. Okay, that'll leave us last but not least item 19.144. That's an ordinance relative to another stop sign. This one on Hampton Avenue. Does this one exist? Yes, it does. It does. <laughs> okay. I'm so glad the word. Yeah, the story to this one is <laughs> that while putting together the TPC agenda at DPW with Cindy, Donna popped her head in the door and she says, "We got another one." <laughs> they don't like putting them up, but they don't like getting ordinances for the ones that are up. <laughs> yeah. And this this uh, stop sign went in when we uh, did the rebuild of Hampton Avenue. Right. And that. Um, so this is a little this is kind of an after the fact oh we did that we need to codify it in city ordinance and that's why this is here i'm always curious because that stop sign tells people to do precisely what they do anyway right i mean i don't know of a particular problem as people would enter pleasant street you really don't have much of a choice if you i mean the law is as you come to a major artery and you're the cross street, you're supposed to stop. You don't have the right of way. It's not like somebody can whip in and and just cut into traffic. So we put a stop sign there to tell people to do what they're they have to do physically anyway. That's okay. I've got no problem. It's the cost of installing a stop sign. But the other issue is of course, and this is what John Morrison hung his hat on years and years ago, is the no left hand turn off Hampton Avenue onto Pleasant which as he argued was a state highway and thereby the city had no jurisdiction over the road it was determined that point in fact actually the city does have jurisdiction on state highways as they come through the city in any event there you go there's that history i just think it's superfluous but so what it's there i'm not going to say tear it down locked up now, <laughs> not yet no trials pending still <laughs> alleged um, um any further discussion on this item uh, all those in favor of referring this with a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 And I have a motion. I didn't record one that time. 
I'll move it. I moved it as a group. No, no, this is the stop sign. This, yeah, this one didn't or... fall under the aegis oh, of the group. We no, only did the row ones. Okay, so I'm sorry. So we got a motion. Okay, now let's have a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And I'm hearing no opposition or abstention. So that too. Move to adjourn. Second. There's a motion to adjourn and second. Any discussion on the adjournment? No, because we can't have a discussion on that. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you all very much. Can I have a discussion?